Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Brand Exchange Podcast. I am very excited to welcome our guest this week, Mr. Freddy Luchterhand. He has a decade of experience in brand strategy, brand development, and has worked with companies such as Lander and Fitch and many, many more. Scrolling down on your LinkedIn uh, was quite a journey. And currently handling plus 40 plus portfolio companies for Open Space, a Singaporean based VC firm as the vice president of brand impact and marketing. Freddie, very delighted to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, OG. Super exciting <laughs> to be here. Very generous introduction as well, as always. Yeah. Singapore to Manila. Yeah. All right. Also a big honor. The last show for me for this year, 2022, very weird year, but uh, yeah. let's hope the next year will be a little bit more peaceful and Just less don't ask me for any predictions. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were all done with predictions at the end of 21. No. <laughs> No, no. no one knows. No worldly political uh, no. predictions, yeah. We may be in the branding industry, but let's get to that later on. There's this one question that will never change that all of our guests get. And I'd like to just like bite through the door here and say, Freddie, what is branding to you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. I'm glad you ask it to everyone because I think <laughs> everyone has a different view, right? And this is the irony of, of marketers or marketing is that we also have a like a marketing problem, right? Like I think no one really knows how to define brand or what brand is or can agree on what branding is, right? And then when you go to a you know the board or you go to a you know a financial officer and you say, well we need money for brand and your own industry sometimes struggles to identify what on earth you're talking about, you kind of have to say, well, maybe it's fair enough that they they're not so supportive because if we don't know, then they don't know. But I think, I mean, everyone kind of eventually comes to their own conclusion about what what branding is, right? And I think yeah. for me, boil it down, it's a simple idea at the heart of a company that informs everything you do. In that sense, it becomes like a platform for action, right? You have to understand that simple core motivating idea in order to say, well, how's it going to inform the 360, right? How's it going to inform my marketing? How's it going to inform my physical office design? How's it going to inform... Uh, service design, right? And, and eventually, if you have that at the heart of a sort of concentric circle, everything ladders back to it and everything begins to deliver on it. So I've always thought about it as a, as a platform for action, right? I think that's, there's something very animated about a good brand. When I say simple and clarity, I think you can go back to all these great brands, right? And look at the ones that have been over 50, 60, 70 years, been consistently building it to the point that everyone goes, I want to be like them today. Right. The reason being is that they've taken one simple idea and they've just conveyed it in different ways as times have changed or in different cultures. So I think of it like the spine that runs through the brand, right? So for instance, mm. um, Disney, you could boil down to one word, which is magic. You know, Coca-Cola, you can boil down to one word, which is um, happiness. Yeah. You know, and, and Land Rover, you can boil down to one word, which is, you know, adventure. So I think I think you know, that's what I see branding as. Um, mm. But I think when I get excited about branding is when it becomes the bridge between the product or the business and the consumer, right? And perception, let's talk about perception, right? Perception is the door to the consumer's mind, right? And brand ultimately deals with perception, right? And so that's... I've always been interested personally in, in understanding why consumers make a choice, right? And I think branding can explain that a lot. So if, if you take, this is kind of related, uh, related to sort of decision-making science, right? So the, the sort of work of Daniel Kahneman, right? Um, system one, system two. And actually when he talked about that in his Nobel Prize speech, he referenced a very famous sort of diagram and, you know, maybe we'll put a link to it or something that people can see because I'm going to sure. try and explain it, but, you know, it, you kind of need to see it to believe it. But he showed this image where you had two identical gray boxes next to each other. Mm -hmm. And around it were two other gray boxes of slightly different shades. Now, we know, we can literally tell ourselves those boxes in the middle are exactly the same gray, but we cannot help but see them differently. One appears lighter, one appears darker, right? And that's because of this framing that happens in the background. Yeah. Now, to me, gray branding relates to that framing effect, right? You can put two identical products together, like in a blind test, and consistently 
a branded product will come out better than an unbranded product in terms of perceptions of quality or perceptions of taste. And that's because we're layering behind it, you know, a frame. And that frame is built by all those things that we can do if we think about a brand as a platform for action. You know, so for an example, you know, when I'm thinking about a great brand that builds, you know, a, a perception or a frame, I would think about something in a commodity category like water, right? And and you could take a store brand water, it's blue, it's got a water <laughs> drop on it, it says water. I mean, the frame they're putting around it is this is going to hydrate you, right? It's just right. plain and simple. Then you take a brand like Fiji water and the frame <laughs> they wrap around it is exoticism and exploration. And suddenly a product that is ultimately going to do the same, it's going to hydrate me. I believe in it enough to say I'll pay a huge premium, probably yeah. 10x what yeah. that other store bought water would do, right? And that is the power of brand. If you understand it as that frame, then you begin to understand what we mean when we talk about brand equity, right? And when we talk right. about studying and mapping perception for brands, that's what we're doing, right? And so whenever I work with anyone, I try and say, well, let's get an idea that can, can motivate you to take action. But when we talk about how we're going to communicate that, let's consider the framing effect, let's think about perception, and think about how we're going to build that to the point that we can actually influence decisions. Super good. Yeah, I just, uh, I'd like to recap the first part for our audience today. I think another word that I've heard before that I think you use spine. Uh, some mm -hmm. other people use like a brand DNA where you basically try to describe your entire brand in one word. It sounds very simple. It's very, very hard to do. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of uh, dedication to kind of like really sit down together and try to filter that out. But whoever might not be 100% confident on, on what your brand is or who you're talking to, etc., what your positioning is, trying to figure that out will be a very, very good first step in the right direction. So if you're interested in it, check out more episodes or Google it, but brand DNA or trying to represent your word, uh, your brand in one word is super, super important. As Freddie just said, I think. That's the foundation for many great success stories in the branding world. I'm so glad that you said on that as well. It's a great starting point, right? Because it's literally the beginning. And this, <laughs> this is where, you know, I think you've been consulting. I think I've been consulting, right? And it gets so irritating, right? As I said, when a company, you know, a startup or anyone comes to you and goes, we want to change our brand. We want to think about it. And we would like to be like Nike or Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, like, okay. And they go, well, we want a brand like that. We want to be as powerful as that. And you realize, okay, well, look, it starts with figuring out what you stand for. Coca-Cola did that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. What it actually takes to be successful is repeat, 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 right? Find something so meaningful, so compelling, so powerful that you don't mind 50 years down the line still telling that same story, right? The discourse around happiness has changed considerably from the 1950s <laughs> To now, right? But it's still relevant. We all still want to be happy. Equally, what happiness means in India versus what happiness means culturally in the US is different. It doesn't mean Coca Cola can't tell it. It's still laddering back, right? And I think that's what I would say. It's like you need to figure out that spine because if you don't, you're like jelly and you're all over the place. Once you have it, great. Let's let's own it. Let's be proud of it, and let's find ways to keep telling that story, right? Because repetition over time will build that equity. 100%. I couldn't agree more. What an awesome start. Um, so in your current career path as the consultant for many, many portfolio companies, like what, what do you do if maybe at the beginning time a founding team or the founders themselves don't value the brand aspect of it? as much as you so how do you make sure that you guys start on the same page like do you have an intro story that you usually tell or that has that ever happened to you yeah i mean i think i think just to start with like it's you know i find myself now this sort of lone creative and <laughs> you know always my one of the partners always likes to call me his sort of British anthropologist you know, I don't know that <laughs> either, but you know i'm this kind of slightly hard to place conceptual thinker in a venture capital firm, right? 
and I'm surrounded by people whose language is numbers and who are terrifyingly smart, right? And there yeah. I am, like sort of the coloring in department. And <laughs> people like love it, but they don't really know how to make sense. But even within my own firm, yeah, I had to sort of, you know, persuade them that this was a good thing to do in terms of service offer. That we yeah. for companies. And, and luckily, open space, you know, ahead of the curve, always been slightly braver in terms of doing things like this, said, we'll come on board, right? And so that's how I get to work with so many startups, right? As you said, we've now got like 40, 45 plus across mm. different stages, right? You know, we're not just, we don't really do seed. We, we go in series A, which is something that I didn't realize would be so important. Actually, it's series mm -hmm. A moment, but we also work with, you know, series C and D up as well. So like so many different challenges, different right. sizes, different scales, and of course, completely different founders, all with a different understanding or willingness to understand. Um, so is there one way that I sort of go in and persuade not really. Like, there's no one story I can tell that's just going to make them go bing. How wonderful brand is something we've been missing. This is like, oh my God, I feel complete. My life feels fulfilled. What it tends to be, I find, and this is just my approach, is get on the phone or go meet them, go have a coffee and talk, right? Don't even necessarily bring up all the things that we may look at the brand and go, my God, they need help, right? <laughs> just go and Go and talk to them, get to understand them, get to understand their business, build a relationship, right? Because in branding, it's a subjective game, right? It's not an objective mm. game. There's no formula with the correct answer. And so in the end, if I say, I believe this is right, that's my view as a consultant, right? They, there's no way to prove that. And right. so I find that go and build rapport, go and build trust first, right? Because then when it comes to talking about branding, which can feel very personal even for a startup founder they, they don't always detach from the brand you know it's correct they conceived it becomes much easier to have a conversation because they're kind of more willing to listen to you and then you know you can make your case right make your case a great founder we work with great founders will always go away and consider it they may come back and go i hear it but not now fine or they'll say okay well let's do it the other option is to say I need to find, I call it sort of like the entry point, right? I need to find something that's slightly more metric, right? Mm. That I can show them that just makes them alert to the impact that it is having, right? So that might be to say, well, we've looked at the latest brand health tracker and, you know, the conversion in the funnel is extraordinarily low, right? Mm. You're losing X number of people at this point. And that could be a branding problem, right? Or our top of mind awareness is poor because we haven't got a distinctive asset. We look very similar to a competitor and, you know, misattribution is, is very high, right? Which means we're misspending some of our dollar on advertising in order to advertise someone else potentially, right? Because people don't recognize it as us. Once right. you find that metric, often founders will go, okay, that's great. You start with that and, you know, let's solve the website. Let's solve the the distinctive assets problem. And then you can start slowly building it, right? And saying, well, okay, well, now we've done this. If we're really talking about branding, we kind of need to do all these other things. And they're kind of, they'll, they'll come on board eventually, right? And you can yeah. do it step by step. Yeah, and usually, it usually takes a detour until you reach the foundation problem. So. It does. And, you know, as a good strategist, you'll be able to go and say, great that we want to resolve the website. Great that we want to resolve the distinctive assets. But... Let's not do it all over again in two months. Until yeah. we understand the strategy. Because if we're right. doing that, what we might end up with is beautiful but not useful. And that's the pitfall of branding, right? That's when you Where go, you know, nice logo, pretty colors, great. Is it actually motivating people to take action? Is it delivering on the frame that we've trying to build? If not, nice. Well said. Yeah, I think the only thing I would like to add for this conversation is one one aspect that is, I think, not popular at all when due to some, I am just going to call it a sales meeting, but it's not uh, to like an opening discovery call is that just sometimes providing the aspect that branding starts internally. For me, a good way to, to start conversations, because if you make sure that maybe 
the creative director, the copywriter and some other salesperson don't need to come to you every two weeks anymore to just kind of like get approved on which content to make or what kind of things we can say and talk about because now everyone is aligned on what we want to do next year, what the goal is and who we're talking to and what to, in which tone, then like that alone just saves in some cases millions of millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Just internal alignment because branding always starts inside Everything that comes out of that shell is external communication, whatever people perceive, perception, we talked about it. But I think that the internal part is always a little bit invisible, unvisible mm. for teams to directly get. All right. I just crank up one more time the difficulty of this conversation. I want to talk about term brand strategy and maybe just to have some epiphany moments here on brand strategy versus business strategy. It took me a long time to understand it is all a big mess in all these strategy related terms. But how have you experienced those two things correlate to each other, building next to each other, working, keeping consistent? Like what's your take on it? Great question. And you're handling quite a hot potato, right? Even in the word <laughs> strategy, right? And, and so I think that's, that's maybe just start, you know, strategy is right. And, and yeah. to me, Strategy is about directions, right? Strategy deals with the future. It directs choices. It dictates how we should allocate resources within the business. And it basically explains how we intend to win, right? That's strategy. Now let's put business as a prefix or brand as a, as a prefix. Business strategy is about how we're going to make money. What choices are we going to do to make money? or whatever out other outcome you may measure your business success on, right? If you're not profit, how are we going to do that? Brand strategy is how are we going to use the brand in order to grow the business, right? And so that becomes uh, a decision about how we are going to, as I say, create that frame, how are we going to create demand for our products, you know, and it becomes a platform for action as we think about it, right? But like, ultimately, mm -hmm. like brand strategy cannot be, separate to business strategy because then you're communicating something wholeheartedly different but brand strategy is in service of the business strategy right like if we get the brand right we grow the business if we grow the business we make money mm -hmm. Done, right and those that's where the two are interrelated okay so you say business strategy always first and then brand strategy or is it a chicken and egg discussion it's a bit of a chicken and egg discussion i think i mean let's be honest Is it for most people business strategy first or brand strategy first? Probably not. It's probably product first, right? And I think, you know, eventually then you need to layer on how we're going to grow this business. And you also mm -hmm. probably need to think about how we're going to build the brand, right? I think most people start with, with the product or the service idea first, right? And then it becomes those two layers. But of course, in some cases, a, a brand strategy can change the way we you know, think about how we're going to, you know, make money, right? You know, it, it can have an impact on an innovation level or on a development level, because suddenly we have a guiding idea that makes, gives us a sort of compass or some sense of clarity as to what we should be doing. But equally, sometimes, you know, of course, brand branding strategy, in most cases will follow a business strategy. Right. And, and so, yeah, but I think ultimately, like both of them, I'd say, deal with deal with directions. Right. And choices. Yeah, for sure. I think strategy was definitely one of the most overused words this year. So I have to be careful calling everything strategy these days. Five notes in an Excel sheet. Well, it's great. Marketing you can charge deal. more if you use the word strategy. Right? <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, I think if you really think about it, a strategy is direction and strategy is choices, right? That's what you're doing with it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your point of view on that. I think that was pretty clear. I hope everyone got the same or at least got the description of that uh, thank you all right we talked very specifically about very hard problems inside branding and strategy so let's keep it easy a bit before we dive even deeper into that we don't want to lose our audience and maybe talk a little bit about the job you have the vc world startups go a little bit away from the branding part and i mean I read many things about open space i'm hearing great things about from you like why did you end up joining open space like what excites you every day as you said like i think you know the, my career took me in a lot of different directions right and i was very lucky at the time i started with a grab program that was you know with omnicom and you know i got to go to sort of five different agencies over two years and that was great because that was an accelerated way of figuring out you know what you're good at and what you like you know it takes a lot of people a lot longer right and i realized 
okay, well, I, I really got passionate at the time about, you know, consumer understanding, you know, consumer psychology. And so I went into a sort of ethnographic insights agency, you know, for a time. And then I sort of added on top of that and said, well, now I understand, you know, why hopefully why people, or I can better under try and understand why people do what they do or make the decisions they make. Now I want to ladder on, you know, the strategy part of that for branding to really take that insights, take that knowledge and, you know, turn it into a strong brand platform. You know, I was doing that for a few years. I was, you know, consulting and, and then, you know, I said, actually, what I really enjoy is when I can see that the projects I'm having are not incremental, right? It's not just, we changed our brand five years ago. It's time for an, you know, it's time for an evolution. It was mm -hmm. when I figured if we get this right, the impact is going to be disproportionate, right? Because brand, they haven't realized it, but brand is a huge lever for them to pull and we can help them do that, right? And so I got very excited by those kind of projects and where do most of those projects exist in a venture capital firm? Because you're dealing with companies at the startup or scale up phase, right? Where brand can have a real impact. And then I sort of scratched my head and went, but most people in a VC firm do numbers, and I've not ever really been great friends with, with numbers. I was never going to go into a VC firm on the investment side, right? There are people out there who are so much better at it than I would ever be. Please let them do it. Mm -hmm. And then I came across Open Space, right? And, and Open Space, you know, I didn't realize this about VC firms, but some will just have an investment team and some will have a sort of more active involvement approach, right? And Open Space is split between the investment team and what we call the operations team, right? And that ops team... Okay is a platform of different people with different expertises that, you know, go and help our portfolio companies, right? So we've got people in data science, technology, ESG, legal, HR. And, you know, I met with our two, at the time, I the two co-founders and the two partners at the time. And I said, why is no one talking about brand, right? Like it's an intangible asset. We know that it's hard to measure, but we know it creates value. Yeah. We, know it, we know it can actually impact on the valuation of a business. Why does no one do it? Why has no one done it? And they sort of went, fair enough. We'll make the case and we can do it. I managed to join and it was a bit of one of those ones where, you know, I joined during COVID and laptop arrived via a delivery man and we were stuck at home. And, you know, I joined my first Monday morning call, said hello, and then the call dropped and it was like tumbleweed, right? It's like, yeah. what do I do now? Right. You know, no one, I don't have, I, you know, I'm a team of one within the business, right? No one was kind of saying, here's a project. This is what you're going to yeah. do. Right. Awesome. So that's when it started with my realization, you just pick up the phone and go talk to people and eventually you'll figure it out. But there was a risk inherent in it because right, the, no one had done it. There was no way to say, well, it's worked in this VC firm in this part of the world or whatever. Therefore, like, I believe if I'm good at it, hopefully then it will work as well. So we agreed. We said, look, risk on my side, risk on their side. So I was obviously a bit worried. And what I realized though, and this is the interesting part, is that if you go in at seed, to some extent, brand doesn't matter as much, right? And it pains me to say that. But at that point, you're really dealing with your product, right? Or your service, trying to make sure that it fits the market, right? There's a lot of iterations. A lot of our companies pivot. It's not a failure. It's good business practice, right? But when you get to kind of series A, you're growing fast. You've got that sort of product market fit more or less. And that's when brand actually can have a really big impact. And I say that because of the way marketing is operating now and the way, you know, brand can impact, right? And I call it, well, I, sort of performance plateau, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of, so look, I mean, at any one time in any, pretty much any category, right? It's sort of a 95 five rule, which means only 5% of people who would buy your product, who would be interested in your product or service, are in market for it at that one moment, which means 95% of people who might want you tomorrow, six months, one year down the line, are not in market for you, right? You come to market as a new company with a solution or a product that solves a genuine problem that this 100% have. At that time, maybe 5% of people are ready to take you, right? So you premise your business model on cheap acquisition costs because you seem to be putting out digital ads performance marketing ads and suddenly like just people are taking it up because you've got a great product you're solving a problem eventually you hit your local maximum right where you've targeted and you've retargeted and everyone who's kind of wants you at that one moment is has got you or tried you 
And suddenly it becomes a lot more expensive to acquire a customer. CAC goes up, suddenly people have scratched their head. That business model was premised on, on cheaper cost of acquisition. Things don't look so rosy. The budget gets cut. The budget doesn't get put to what it should do in order to grow. And you hit this kind of plateau, right? And this is where often I've seen it happen around series A to B. And that's where like, the brand conversation becomes super relevant, right? Because you know, in the end, brand is a tool to create future demand. And that means that we have to split the way we build our business and the way we market into two things, right? You have to create your future demand and you have to harvest your existing demand. And there are different tools that are needed for both. This is what I try and encourage a lot of our startups to think about, right? Is brand is your best tool to create that future demand, to create the extra share of voice over the long term that creates extra market share, that makes people more excited or more aware or more readily mentally available around your product and your service so that when they do become someone in that moment of choice who does want your kind of product or service, you're the brand that comes to mind in that moment of choice. You cannot do that through performance marketing alone. You need to do that through brand marketing, right? And this is the, the short-term, long-term debate. I'm sure you know your GDI is happening a lot in marketing right now. And it's great for, for us, right? Because it, actually brand is suddenly making a, a bit of a comeback, you know, into some extent, right? Like brand was everything. And then a lot of engineers got really, you know, excited and tried to solve this whole, like, want to make a problem of, you know, 50% of my advertising is misspent, but I don't know what 50% it is, right? Yeah. He came in and said, well, if that's the case, we're, we're losing 50%, then let's try and quantify it. Let's try and make it more measurable. And loads of engineers who didn't really care about how people make decisions or think about that came in and really focused down and did one of the best bits of marketing and marketing, which was to call it performance marketing. Right mm -hmm. now, the confusion people had was that performance marketing does not necessarily mean it performs better. It's just <laughs> right. You pay on the measure of performance, like a click, rather than you pay for placement. But people got very excited by the fact you could see the ROI, that it was more measurable, right? And it became the dominant discourse. Yeah, brand because it's very hard to measure got really lost out, right? Unfortunately. True. But now we see so many of these companies who have hit this performance plateau. And suddenly we've got more research being done by, you know, like Les Bonnet and Peter Feld and all these people, these great researchers, not, you know, the, the team down at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, right? And they're putting numbers to brand to say, look, we can actually quantify the impact it has. And yeah. so suddenly, you know, brand marketing, as this means to create future demand, as a means to balance out the short term and the long term, it's becoming de rigueur again, right? It was, you know, 100%. It was super exciting because there was a moment where I honestly, three, four years ago, a lot of people were saying like, well, brand's becoming irrelevant, right? Mm. right? Brand is no longer what it used to be. Like brand yeah. is the sort of this highly conceptual, esoteric thing. And we didn't really have any data to fight back with, right? We just had to try and use our powers of persuasion. Now right. we see brand coming back. You've got these business challenges that happen around the stage that we're operating. And, you know, suddenly brand becomes this, this great tool that you can convince a startup founder to use to actually give themselves that um, the growth, right? Yeah, I think you opened it earlier with being subjective. I think, you know, that will never change. You will never be able to the same strength in the direct fist fight with some performance marketing numbers, dude. Or girl, but yeah, I just wanted to quickly go back and uh, applaud you to uh, creating a job at the company. So I think if I've never heard that before. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to work at a firm and they are not hiring, just convince them that the position doesn't exist yet. And then just offer to run your own job description. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So those were all the positive things. Like, uh, do you have one very memorable moment this year from a brand that you worked with and uh, just going into a cheesy yearly review now? One particular moment. There's been lots of great ones, like great successes, right? But, you know, I, I would say one moment and like, this isn't sort of, you know, self glorifying, but, you know, there was one company that I have been determined the brand, if we could do what we need to do with the brand, it would have a very significant impact on the business, right? And we had this conversation with them a while ago. Mm -hmm. 
and it didn't happen for various reasons. And I think what we've seen beginning to play out is the fact, the consequence of that. Mm -hmm. And I like that to the extent that I can actually now go back to them and say, I know we had that conversation about Brandon. We said that this was a risk. And at the time, it didn't feel like it was appropriate. But now we come to the end of the year, we're beginning to see the weak signals of what we talked about playing out in the market, right? Can we have that conversation again? And of course, they're more than willing to have that conversation again. But the reason I say it to highlight is because it actually shows in the metrics and the way we're looking at it, if we don't resolve brand at the right moment, the right time, it can have a very tangible impact on the business, right? Hmm. You know, and so that's kind of reverse looking at it. Like we didn't do something and this is what's happened versus look, there's some amazing, you know, portfolio companies I work with and we've done great brand work. We've launched it and it's had an impact. We hope that that's the case, right? Mm-hmm. But I think looking at it from an, another side is to say, you know, sometimes we need to convince through a challenge why brand can have an impact and why we should do it earlier. Okay, so your moment this year was kind of like a little reconfirmation of the industry, the services, the skills that you apply every day are uh, as useful as you think you are. (laughs) I mean, me and any branding practitioner, right? Like, I think it's just sometimes it's easy to get, you know, pigeonholed, right? But when you actually, like, when you look at it and go, brand can have an impact. And if we don't do it, it's not just like it would continue and it would get better if we branded. Like if we don't use brand in the way that it should be used, it can actually see have an impact going you know, on a downward trend for the business, right? And so that was just, it's, it's reassuring, I suppose, is the word I would use. You know, a brand discussion isn't a nice to have. It's a fundamental. Absolutely agree. Well, that's, um, I'm very happy that you had many, many great moments this year. I just would like to again flip this conversation as well, maybe talk a little bit about risks and not necessarily for you, but maybe if some younger founders are listening today and thinking like, okay, Freddie, what do you think might be like one of your top experienced like risks when they're dealing with someone like you or your firm? What have you experienced so far? Like what goes wrong often? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. There's a lot of things. I think the one that... I notice and that I often try and, and rectify, right, is, as I said, a lot of these startups, you know, begin with, with the product, right, a product idea. Now, when you start, you have to market that product and that becomes your focus, which is absolutely right. But as you grow, you actually need to start thinking about building the brand, not just the product, right? And the risk I've seen is sometimes the company has become so focused on that or the, the founders are so focused on the product that the mm-hmm. entire mindset that permeates the, the business is one of a product orientation, right? Mm, yeah, Just to for say, sure. create a great product and the people will come. That, to me, is a very, very dangerous mindset. And the reason is, is because it completely forgets about people, right? And so I, what I try and do is often... Like we try and convince culturally or like through the founders to switch from a product orientation mindset to a call it a customer or a market orientation mindset, which is to say, let's go out there and just ask people, what are the needs? What are the tensions? What are your desires? Right. What's your position in the market? So it's not really about the brand at that at that moment, right? This is more about like, let's understand. I mean, what problem do you fix? What I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what actually do people need and how can our product service that? And that's not a static one moment in time thing. You have to mm. check in with those people consistently, regularly, and not see any change in their views and that might have an impact on your product as a criticism of your product see it as your product being in better service of them. But if you're so focused on your product, you can get lost, right? You can have a great product that isn't doing well and people scratch their head and go, but it's a great product. And it's mm. like, yes, but it's only a great product if it actually functions and actually has a use value to the people you're trying to get to. And maybe sometimes that, that bridge is missed, right? And so yeah. I think it would be my advice is to, to really be cognizant of not getting trapped as you grow into a product-orientated mindset, but be willing to let that go 
and become much more market or, or customer oriented. Perfect. I think that might really help some, some founders here because I've seen that day and night trying to sell your product, you can't become a salesman, right? Like you have to create something holistic, something engageable, something a little bit more than that. And I think just if you also focus on your product too much, I think your entire communication just automatically becomes very pushy because if you're talking about something that is from you, you're automatically saying, okay, this might be for you, which is becomes kind of a salesy conversation, which I will definitely skip your ad if you try to do that to me and i'm pretty sure majority of humanity as well so i think that that was a very great summary of what can go wrong so guys please think about the bigger picture uh, you are much more than your product we've talked already 40 minutes but i just would like to ask you one cheesy question that you asked me not to ask you about what's trending or not but You work with so many startups this year, and uh, I'm sure you've seen very exciting things and trends coming up. Could you give us a very brief sneak peek into what you believe, which trends are holding up to next year and beyond? I think next year we'll see the brand conversation grow even more, right? And I think there'll be a new understanding around brand. And I think a lot of people are realizing that brand marketing you know, is not something that we should have to defend when we get on an earnings call, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that's going to accelerate in terms of that realization, that broader understanding is because, you know, in the VC world, particularly, I think everyone would have read about it. A lot of companies now having to shift from sort of growth to profitability. We can't just Correct. grow at all costs. We actually have to be profitable at how we acquire customers, how we get the right customers who are of high value. And as I said to you before, right? Brand marketing is a means to create that future demand. So I think we will see that that conversation not gains traction, but also broader understanding. And I think what's going to have happen as a consequence of that, which is what interesting is that you're going to see a lot of digital marketers who've spent a lot of time really honing their skills now in, you know, the performance, the tracking side of things, you know, are suddenly going to realize that if they want to upskill to grow as marketers, You're going to see a lot of people trying to learn brand building, right? And the skills required in brand building, because it's super different. You know, a lot of people who went into digital marketing, you know, may have come in from more of an engineering mindset to go into this kind of much more quantifiable approach to it, right? And brand building is a much more conceptual, to some extent, skill set, right? So I think you're going to see digital marketers trying to learn to also be brand you know, builders. It won't be easy, but I think like that's going to happen in terms of what kind of skill sets are going to be required. I think that's very, I, to me, that's super interesting, right? Because I think, yeah. you know, we sort of joked at the beginning that we don't really fully, no one can really fully understand or define what brand is, but I think you're going to see the word coming back much, much more or returning or showing up much more in, in 2023. And then like my personal, like, you know, one thing I've talked about a lot, you know, with one of our portfolio companies and one area of branding that I think I'm excited about that I think will continue into 2023 is, you know, cross collaborations and, and brand partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we've seen, we scratched the surface of it. I think it's such a powerful way of two brands sharing equities and also of brands, particularly in sort of, you know, more commodity categories like coffee, water, actually finding ways to create consistent cultural relevance And I think the, the, the exciting part is there's no end to it, right? Like you can have the most interesting combinations, right? You know, I saw Heineken recently partnered with a, a kind of ASICs, I think, right? To, to create um, the Heineken, right? Which was trainers <laughs> with liquid beer in the soul. Oh my right? God. Now that's just interesting, right? And it, uh, when, you, uh, when you go back to what great advertising is, I've always been a huge advocate of it being a creative endeavor, right? Like create standout, create cut through, create memorability is very powerful advertising. So I've been served a huge number of ads on my, on my own channels. I see a huge number of ads every day. I walk through the, the city here in Singapore. I don't remember many of them, but I remember the Heineken scene that was scrolled up on my LinkedIn <laughs> one day months ago. Right? And that is yeah. powerful. That is really, really powerful. And I, I genuinely believe brand partnerships is a, phenomenal way to achieve 
fame making, great, creative, unexpected, surprising content on a brand level. Yeah. And so I, I think we're going to see more of that happening. I think as, as brands try to tap into different subcultures, different generations, different audiences, I think, you know, brand partnerships look out for more of them next year. Yeah, for sure. I haven't thought about that in a while. Just a f funnily, the first thing that pops up in my mind is Japanese airlines always partnering up with like Pokemon or Hello Kitty and yeah. just like putting the entire airplanes into different wraps Over air. and just to make some new exciting things out of something that many people count as standard, boring, everyday travel or whatever. But uh, yeah, thanks for putting it back on my radar. It'd be interesting to to talk about that next time. But all right, Freddie, thank you so much. I just would like to say one last thing before we end this session today. Freddie and me talked so long about like, you know, getting the foundation, like perception of branding, brand strategy, etc. And I think like one thing, one really easy thing without pulling up an entire exercise is that everyone can do is to just ask yourself more whys. Like why, if you have a product, why does the product exist? The product exists because I know how to make it better. Okay. Why are you able to make it better? What's driving you? What, like, keep asking yourself why until you reach a certain level of a foundation where you say, okay, that word is so simple but can be flexed and like shared into so many different arms and angles of of my business that maybe that can be my spine maybe that can be my dna of the conversation that we had at the beginning right so asking yourself why you wake up in the morning asking yourself why this product matters asking yourself why these are really really hard questions okay be 100 honest with yourself this will take time this is not a one-day exercise but Again, it's a very great starting point from our experience. Freddie, I hope you can agree with a quick DIY tip at the end. We used to call it the um, the five whys exercise, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, it's, it sounds piss easy, right? Five <laughs> whys. It's really hard, right? Why, as you said, why do we exist? That first why, that's going to be easy, hopefully. If not, <laughs> think when you get... Three, four layers further down, it becomes really, really mm -hmm. difficult, right? Um, so, yeah, it's a, it, you, you kind of have to embrace being like an annoying child, right? Why, oh, why, yes. why, yeah. why, why, why? Yeah. And uh, eventually, as you say, you'll distill it down into something that's very compelling and different. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's let the audience get crazy with the five whys. I hope everyone finds this useful as always. Freddie, thank you so much for a great value, great insights, and great future and great future insights as well for what's coming up. Excited for what brand partnerships are going to show me next year. Happy holidays. And right, again, fun. thank you for being here. Thank you, Eugene. And thanks for doing this. I think this is great that you're doing something that's You know, again, shining a little bit more of a light on branding, right? And, and what it can do. So appreciate everything <laughs> you're doing. And, uh, well, yeah, I'll, um, see I'll you next year. 2023, man. All right. Nice one. Bye. Bye everyone.